So I'm just going to kind of talk through biased questions. Now, to me, these are kind of common sense, but people tend to overlook these things. Uh, some questions may use language that people can associate with emotions. So if your question is, how much of your time do you waste on Facebook? How is somebody supposed to interpret that question? Some people may not see that the time that they spend on Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or spending their fidget spinner as wasting their time. Uh, they may see it as a useful uh, use of their time. Or, for example, this one was obviously written by math teacher. Do you prefer the wonderful math class or the boring Shakespeare class? You're leading people into their opinions. You have to be very careful about the adjectives and whatnot that you put into questions like that. Or here's another example. Some questions may refer to a majority or an authority figure. So this question says, would you agree with the NCIP that's a teaching uh, group that teachers should get paid more for earning their master's degree? You're leading them into believing that, oh, well, if the NCIP believes this, then yeah, I should probably be agreeing with them. Uh, so, again, you got to be careful about the way that these questions are phrased, that you're not leading people into an opinion. Or, this happens more often, it's just phrased awkwardly. Let's read this one. Do you disagree with people who oppose the ban on smoking in public places? I don't know about you, but I'm not exactly sure what that question is saying because of the double negative. Do you disagree with people who oppose? Okay, how am I supposed to answer that with a yes or am I supposed to answer that with a no? You gotta really think about that, but you'd be surprised at how often questions like this are in service. People don't phrase them well, and so it can mess up your results because people are confused by the way the question is worded. We talked about this a little bit before, sampling bias. It's when your subgroups are either overrepresented or underrepresented. You have to have random and fair selection. So here's an, here's an issue. If it's voluntary, people have to voluntarily turn in, turn in a survey. You're looking at some sampling bias there because not everybody has an equal chance of returning that survey. The convenience, I mentioned that that could have bias because you're not you don't have an equal chance of running into everybody if you just stay in one location. In some cases, there's exclusion. You only ask certain people purposefully because you know that they're going to answer in a certain way. Or underrepresentation, you don't have a big enough sample size. This says that you're supposed to have one sixth of your population or at least 30 people to have a good sample size for your survey or your experiment. Or, how about it's just not random? You pick the first five people on every page of the phone book. Or what about the other 95% of the page? They don't even have a chance if you're just picking the first five people on every page. Or self-selection, people choose their own groups. And a lack of double blindness. We talked about blindness last week. That can uh, affect sampling bias. So, this is pretty obvious, but tell me if it's question bias or sampling bias. A person asks, do you prefer delicious things, pancakes, or cold soggy cereal? Question bias or sampling bias? <laughs> I, love, I love cold soggy cereal too. Um, I'm just a lot of calories, but. but the problem is with the question. Right? If we took those adjectives, delicious and cold and soggy, out, then the question is fine. Do you prefer pancakes or cereal? Nothing wrong with that question, but when we put those uh, adjectives in there, it throws it off. Okay, how about this one? Asking people shopping at a farmer's market if they think locally grown fruit and vegetables are healthier than supermarket fruits and vegetables. Question bias or sampling bias? Sampling. Of course, if you're asking people at the farmer's market, that's why they're at the farmer's market, because they think that their products are superior to the supermarket products. Okay, how about this one? A survey about whether or not teachers who earn their master's degrees should get paid more is sent out to all teachers in North Carolina. 
Same old advice. Obviously, teachers are going to think, hey, we deserve more money, especially if I have our master's degrees. I agree. Okay, but you guys might not think so. I would hope that you do, but you might not think so. You might think that we're overpaid. I don't know. Okay, here we've got these very cool. We've got to be careful when we summarize our data as well. Not just when we're collecting the data, how we collect the data, uh, how we phrase things, we have to be careful when we're summarizing as well. Because sometimes we talk about the correlation and causation, sometimes there may just be correlation, so you can't necessarily draw the conclusions that you thought you could. For example, frogs and frogs and no frogs and no legs are deaf. Uh, yeah, there's some left people just random, right? I didn't come up with There's probably a correlation there, but it's not really because the frog doesn't have legs that it can't hear. It's probably more likely that there were like birth defects or something. So there's correlation but not causation. Probably not that either. A, but that's a good example. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter which order you put it in. There is a correlation between those two, but just because it's legless doesn't cause it to not be able to hear. And not because it's deaf doesn't mean it doesn't have legs. Like there's no causation. Alright. Look at that. This is the one that happens more, more often. This is the one that happens more often. You apply your results to the population incorrectly. Okay, if I survey you guys to see what percentage of you like math, hopefully it would be at least 85% you're in an honors math class. But we can't apply that to the entire school because I have a biased sample right here. I'm talking to a classroom full of honors math students. Probably more often, more likely than not, more of you are going to like math than not like math. But I cannot apply that to the entire school because my sample did not come from the entire school population. I had a convenient sample, so I can't apply those results. Now, if I picked two kids from every class in third period, then I could apply those results to the entire school population because my sample was representative of the entire school population. You guys are not necessarily representative of the entire school population. Does that kind of make sense? You gotta be careful what you apply the results to. Your sample comes from the entire population. You can apply those to the entire population. All right. So, We'll talk about margin of error here in a second. So, when researchers look at unbiased sample sizes and apply it to the population, we have what we call a confidence interval. And it means that they are 95% certain that the results are within the margin of error from the percentage. So, if you've ever looked at the, the most common time that I see this is when we're talking about an election. And they show the polling numbers. Have you ever looked down in the corner? And sometimes they'll mention it. They'll say, this candidate has 48% of the vote with a margin of error of 3%. What that means is they mean that that study is 95% confident that the actual percentage that that candidate has, what did I say? 48% with the plus or minus 3, is actually within 51% and uh, 45% of the vote. That's what the margin of error means. So, uh, let's look at some examples here. For Here's a candidate. This candidate, Kaspers, has a 76% approval rating with a 6% margin of error. So that means that they're 95% certain that Kaspers has an approval rating between 70% and 82% because you add and subtract that margin of error from the percentage or from the average or whatever they're giving you. So let's look at example two. So we've got Senator Smith and Miller in a close election. Senator Smith is projected to get 52% of the vote with a 5% margin of error. So the highest amount of the vote is 57%. 
the smallest amount of the vote would be 47% for Smith. And question C, I think, is very neat. It says, what is the highest amount of the vote that Miller is projected to get? Well, we weren't given the amount that, that Miller would get. Obviously, we assume that it would be the other half. So we're trying to figure out the highest amount that Miller could get. And then you take the lowest amount that Smith would get, 47%. And that means we've got 53% left over for Miller to earn if Smith gets the smallest amount. Okay? Here's a different way that these questions can be asked. The percentage of people who speak through a town is between 35% and 43%. Find the mean percentage of people who speed in the margin of error. Well, if we know the endpoints, 35%, 43%, we have a range of 8. The mean is right in the middle of that. So half of 8 is 4. So we've got 39. If we add in 35, we're going to subtract it from 43. Either way. 39 is right there in the middle. 39 is the mean. The margin of error would be 4%. Okay? Now, um, sometimes you will have to calculate the margin of error. I'm not 100% sure if they're going to ask you to calculate the margin of error. And if they do, if they'll give you the formula. So, to be on the safe side, you need to memorize this formula. Okay? 2 times the square root of P times 1 minus P over N. P is the percent, it's easy to remember, and N is the number of people. N, number, P, percent. Kind of makes sense. We've already talked about the certainty statement. Uh, here it is just again. We are 95% certain that between your P minus the margin of error and your P plus the margin of error, that many people prefer whatever it is. So here's another example about people preferring cola A. Margin of error of 7.1%, so you add it and you subtract it to get your range right there. It's actually do one where you have to calculate. In a poll of 150 students, 78% said that they enjoyed their teachers this year. So let's find the margin of error here. N is 150. 78%, we've got to change to decimal form, so 0.78 is what we're going to plug into our equation. So we've got 2 times the square root of 0.78 times 1 minus 0.78 over 150. That 150 is under the square root. So let's make sure everybody's clear on how to put this into their calculator. You can do it one of two ways. Probably the, the best way to do it would be to just type in what's under the square root by itself, okay, 0.78 times 1 minus 0.78, I press enter, I divide by 150, then I would take the square root, and then multiply by, okay, I was just breaking it down, this was the numerator, divided by the denominator, take the square root, multiply by 2, you got to turn that back into a decimal, so that would be 6.7% is the margin of error. So our certainty statement, I don't have space enough to write it up here, but you do on your paper. We need to subtract that from 78, and we need to add it to 78. So our confidence statement would be, we are our certainty statement, excuse me, we are 95% certain that between 71.3% and 84.7% of students enjoyed their teacher this year. We are 95% certain that between 71.3% and 84.7% of students enjoyed their teacher this year would be our certainty statement.